You're listening to Numerically Speaking, the Anaconda podcast. On this podcast, we'll dive into a variety of topics around data, quantitative computing, and business and entrepreneurship. We'll speak to creators of cutting edge open source tools and look at their impact on research in every domain. We're excited to bring you insights about data, science, and the people that make it all happen. Whether you want to learn about AI or grow your data science career, or just better understand the numbers and the computers that shape our world, Numerically Speaking is the podcast for you. Make sure to subscribe. For more resources, please visit anaconda.com. I'm your host, Peter Wayne. All right. So welcome. And I'm very, very excited today to um, have a, a fun and lively, I'm sure, conversation with Jeff uh, Reebok, who is a longtime Pandas maintainer, and um, he is a managing director at Two Sigma. So um, if any of you, uh, any of the listeners on this call have used Pandas, they are benefiting from many, many hard years, uh, many years of hard work by Jeff um, uh, on the project. So thank you, Jeff, and welcome uh, to the Anaconda podcast. No, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, very, very happy to be here, uh, you know, talking to you about, uh, you know, pandas and, and work and all these other kind of nice things. Yes, yes. I'm um, looking forward to getting uh, getting your perspective on all sorts of interesting and fun things. So, um, but let's get started for the listeners who are not um, maybe uh, as familiar. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you got into programming, what your background is, and then also how you got involved in the Pandas project and, and your role as it's evolved over the years. Sure. Um, so like I, I guess a lot of other young folks, I started on Wall Street in the 90s. Um, that speaks <laughs> to my age, of course. Um, and, you know, for years, um, ironically, we actually, I used Perl for a long time. We, we would do really everything. Uh, and this was maybe went on for about 10 or 15 years. I literally wrote everything, back ends, front ends, everything. It was just very convenient wow. to do. Um, yeah, Perl was the thing. And then around, I would say around 2008, 2009, um, I, I switched sort of the role I was doing. Uh, and I said, oh, hey, let's take a look at this Python thing. I started looking uh, looking at Python. Um, and at the time I was, I was working at this new fund. And I said, how do I store data and like, you know, store every day's data, and then I want to retrieve this, okay, like do queries on it. I stumbled upon, uh, at the time, this was an open source package called PyTables, um, and yes. it actually it introduced me to the HDF5 format, and I was like, oh, this sounds awesome. I stumbled upon Pandas, too, and I, I think at the time it was maybe, I don't know if it was 0.1, it was like 0.2 or something. This was back in like <laughs> 2000, maybe 10 or 11 or something, so it was like way before Python was popular. Actually, ironically, I when I first picked up Python, I, I started with the let's do Python 3000 book or something. And of mm -hmm. course that was, you know, in retrospect, you know, we had to go back to Python too, but that was totally fine. Um, and anyway, so I, I started using pandas. Um, this was way back then. And, and I wrote like locally an extension to, to write my data to HDF5 and retrieve it. And it worked great. I was like all excited, got my work done. And, you know, I think about, you know, six months later, my, you know, what I was doing, I, I, I changed roles again. I, I worked at, started working at a different company and I said, okay, let me take a little break. And hey, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they want this in open source. At the time, it was just like, you know, email a guy and, and that guy mm -hmm. happened to be Wes McKinney, the original founder of Pandas. <laughs> and like, I don't think I even did a pull request. I think I like, I may have sent them the code at that point. Maybe GitHub was around. I don't, I don't even super remember, but um, I eventually like, with very limited back and forth. I mean, I had tests and everything, but right. I had not done any open source programming at this point. And ah, so ah, okay. like, like I just sent it to him, he accepted it. It was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I think then at, at this next role I was doing, I, I worked with some former colleagues. Um, I ended up, you know, like I, I was sort of building trading systems. And so, you know, I would take data and do transforms on it, do machine learning on it, um, and, and then, you know, actually do trading on it. And so, it, it turns out that like I was doing a lot of simulation. So I would sit there and like, wait, I would submit some jobs and then wait. And so I had some extra time. I was like, oh, let me go look at this pandas thing. And, and I did. And then <laughs> I, I said, I found some bugs and I'm like, oh, let me go see if I can fix it. It was like a challenge to me. Right. And so I, I eventually started fixing a few bugs here and there. Um, and I, I think this was still maybe 2011 or 2012. And I was, and I did more and more. And then I, I started following the issue tracker and I was like, oh, I'm good at this. I, and I actually liked it too. So I did this for, you know, maybe a few more months. Um, and 
you know, pretty soon I was just like responding to questions, doing PRs, <laughs> uh, like really quickly. I became known uh, very shortly as like a bug would pop up and it would be fixed like five minutes later. I was like, oh, I just like doing that. I like being responsive. Right, right. Um, and so that's how I kind of got started in pandas really. Like I was, I was an enthusiast, I was an enthusiastic user in some sense. Uh -huh. And then I actually liked the technology. I liked how it was being used and like, mm. like to contribute to that. I had time, you know, uh, you know, it was, well, it was you made time. It sounds like, I mean, you had a day job, like most people on wall street, they're quite busy. So <laughs> exactly. Well, this was very much uh, like a researchy time when, uh, as I said, I was just like, just you know, in, in a room with a few guys, and 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 we, we I had a bunch of boxes, and we were able to you know uh, do some simulations. So I uh, st continued contributing to pandas. Uh, you know, this was I think in 2012, something like that. And I I, I found that I, I I was doing it more and more and more. And so and I eventually got uh, involved in some of the early release cycles. I think pandas may have been I don't know 0.8 at this time or something. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think maybe the next year is when I actually started doing some releases myself uh, and nice. really, really taking um, like, I'm not gonna say over the project, but more like really, you know, reviewing other people's uh, pull requests and so on and so forth. And, and coincidentally at the time, uh, you know, Wes started to step back from the project, maybe because I was contributing. And right. so around that time, I ended up starting really, you know, do, doing my own code or, or doing lots of, uh, you know, pull requests myself reviewing other people's code and doing the releases. So, I, and I did that for, I would say several years actually, mm -hmm. um, uh, really full-time, mostly contributing code. Um, well, so I have a question about, I have a question about that. When you, when you cut your first, when you did the first Pandas release, right? The first release of Pandas that you did, how many other people at the time were authorized to do that? Right, so you're basically asking uh, who were other committers, you know what? Being well, not just committers, you, no, no, that like, no, no, not just committers, but people who could actually, uh, who were authorized, sort of socially, had the social capital or the whatever it is, is, you know, commit bid is one thing, but to actually say, yeah, I'm going to go and do a release. At that time, how many other people could actually do a release and were sort of authorized to do so by Wes? Right. I think it was like Wes and maybe like one or two other people. And, and, right. and so it was a very small group at that point. Um, you know, as you know, in open source, you know, people sort of come and go a little bit. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I happened to stick by stick by pandas, and, and I was I was encouraged because we had you know lots of issues, and this is sort of like the hallmark of a successful open source project is that actually people you're using it, and therefore when they use it, they find lots of bugs, and they find issues, and right, and, and find you know make feature requests, and I, I like doing it actually. That's why I was I, I was drawn to this. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I I think there's something around this which is um, you're you obviously through your career in Wall Street. Um, well, so let me back up one step. You know, a lot of people who end up in open source, especially in the, let's say the Python scientific numerical ecosystem, um, they come from science. They come from mathy sort of things, engineering, or you know, have a lot of astronomers that end up in there, um, and uh, and and um, not a lot of people end up coming into it from the from Wall Street or from the finance sector. Um, and I've got my own theories as to perhaps why that is. Um, certainly Python is used a lot in that area and many people there have the skills to contribute, but we don't end up with a lot of long-term contributors, certainly maintainers in the ecosystem who come from, um, FinTech. And so, um, my question, I'm getting to a question here, which is of all of the people you worked with through your career and you started on wall street, you've obviously as a, um, research quant and programmer and all these things, you have met many people who I would assume you would feel are qualified to do this kind of contribution, but you are the one who, who stuck by it, who's answering bug reports and questions, you know, late in the night. Um, is there something particular about you? How many of your colleagues do you feel like could have also done the same or might've had a susceptibility to doing the same, but just, you know, didn't for whatever reason? I, you raise a very interesting point here. I, I think that, uh, there's definitely the skill set on uh, the you know uh, people who work in Wall Street or in fintech. Um, I think there's a couple of factors though that generally play against this. Um, mm -hmm. One is people obviously are super super busy, and you know you just simply don't have the time. Um, it's ironic because I had a, like a little built-in window. This is like a funny story where um, I would so I lived in New Jersey at the time and I was commuting actually into Manhattan and I would do it by ferry. And so I would leave at like six o'clock in the morning <laughs> and I sort of, I have this hour ferry ride. So it's sort of like a, a built-in time where you're awake, 
or you're, well, I don't know if you're wide awake, but you're awake. And it's like, I have an hour to do stuff. So let me do it. And so I did that actually for several years. I think it was like four or five years. This was when pandas got done, to be to be honest, a large extent. You could do a lot in an hour of uninterrupted time. Um, so, Especially so in the morning what, when you're fresh, yes, when you haven't exactly, had the emotional exactly. drain of the day, like a vampire sucking away your creative juice. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So this, I think, is one factor. The other factor is I happen to, so I started it sort of an interim where I was working at a smaller firm where it was kind of my own firm. So actually, so like we didn't have any restrictions on contributing to open source uh, at, at all. And then when I went to subsequent firms, actually, I had the ability to contribute to open source. Um, uh, you know, both I, I, I did work at Continuum, which is the precursor to Anaconda at the time. Mm -hmm, uh, right. And then I worked, I worked at, uh, and I'm working at Two Sigma, and we actually have a very open policy of being able to contribute to open source. So mm -hmm. I think that is one of the big uh, factors here. Most, well, I shouldn't say most, but to my experience, a lot of folks were very, very qualified people. And they're like, they love open source and they use it quite a bit but they may you know, not necessarily have as an open environment. So I think that's one big restriction right. that, that a lot of folks have. I think that's right, changed right. nowadays, but it, you know, for, for many, many years, this has existed this way. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Cause I, you know, um, 10 years ago, ish, nine mm -hmm. years ago, something like that. I remember having a, um, a pretty intense conversation with the CTO of a hedge fund, uh, trying to argue for the use of open source and not only that, but um, allowing some of his employees to contribute back. As opposed to, you know, the mindset on Wall Street is very zero sum. It's very, you know, everything's proprietary. There's no benefit mm -hmm. to releasing the stuff. Why would we give our competitors a, a leg up, make them pay for it, make them pay for devs to fix their own stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there was this kind of conversation that's happening over a, a very fancy steak dinner. Um, and I, I was trying to make the point to him. I said, look, at this point in time, uh, everyone we talked to, and again, this was like 2013 timeframe. It's pandas mm -hmm. was clearly ascendant, but still ascendant and not dominate, not dominant. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was saying, look, every single um, firm that we get called in to talk to, they've created their own crappy version of a pandas like thing around mm -hmm. NumPy, around probably HDF5, like Pi tables for some persistent mm -hmm. stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they've all created their own crappy version. They've got their own little bespoke daytime libraries that they've wrapped and some other calendaring mm -hmm. stuff. And um, every new person you hire coming in the door is going to know pandas and not your own internal crap, right? And and maybe pandas has some bugs, but your internal stuff has bugs too. But there's you know, kind of, there's hundreds of thousands of people looking and using, you know, using pandas, looking at the bugs. Yours has just whatever, the few dozen quants in your firm, right? And so some of these arguments, it was so hard to make those arguments. And I don't think I particularly won that particular discussion. But the point is at the time, just to give, just to reiterate, I think your point about how much the temperatures changed in that industry. At that point, I was having to argue for the, just to use the freaking open source. And now you've yeah. got people like Two Sigma. And of course, Two Sigma is a very forward thinking, long-term uh, sort of uh looking firm. And so they are investing in the open source. And they have been a longtime contributor and supporter of NumFocus. And so we love that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really kudos to Two Sigma for, for, for doing all the right things there for the for the ecosystem. But, um, but, but I think your point about doing the work on the ferry is very interesting. And so I have a question a mm -hmm. little bit around this, which is, you know, sure. there's this theory that people need at least three spaces, the, the home space, the workspace, and a play space. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're on the ferry, you're between spaces. You're not home and you're not at work. And so you have utter liberty to play. You could just play a game. You could be on your phone playing a game or you mm -hmm. could book mm -hmm. or you could hack on some code that mm -hmm. isn't, you know, part of your day job. When we shift the working open source under the realm of the work, even though it's sanctioned, right, it's allowed at work, but it still falls under the work umbrella. Is there a different flavor to that somehow? Does it change at all? Maybe for you, because you got into it, starting with the play space, it's the same, but do you see a difference in how people approach it among maybe younger colleagues who are doing open source for the first time on the clock, so to speak, at Two Sigma? I mean, you absolutely raise a good point. I think that like in my personal experience, um, this was definitely like what I, it was almost my downtime to be very honest. Like, mm -hmm. like some people, like I do, like I read a lot, for example, but I do that like when, of course, when you're not supposed to, you know, at, at night when you're trying to fall asleep, but <laughs> like, and, and so my downtime, like, like I would read on the ferry true. And like, but to me, like sitting in a chair for an hour in the ferry, it actually was to me, like I, I can get stuff done. And I'm like, I like, I feel productive and it's like, it feels good to contribute to open source right there. And it feels good to do it right then. 
and you're right, I'm not distracted by other things. So I think that is definitely a big contributing factor, um, like how I viewed this so-called play space. Yes, I play right. video games, but like, like, I didn't want to do it on the ferry. I, like to me, this is like something that's in between sort of work. It's kind of related to work. So before, before you mentioned uh, that why certain companies have may have had a, we'll call it a negative attitude toward open source and now mm -hmm. have moved full spectrum toward really not just consuming open source, which I think pretty much everybody does nowadays, but actually contributing back. And so my personal experience of this is I think one of the reasons people have embraced this. So I think when they first start using open source, people tend to take the packages that are out there like pandas and they fork them because they're like, oh, I have this bug that, you know, like I fixed internally and I can just, you know, take my own fork of this and put it on top. Right. And that right. works for about five minutes until you realize <laughs> like, I actually would now want to uh, rebase to upstream and I want to use the upstream and then I have to put my patch on top. It became a tremendous amount of work to actually do that. And I know many, many people who have tried to do that and it's always a failure. And so I think a lot of firms realize that it's so much easier to try to just simply push your up fix upstream, get it in there because this is the critical fix. This is the thing you need. And at the same time, you do get obviously the benefit of all the other worldwide contributors. Japan, I mean, there's thousands of people who have contributed and fixed right. bugs, which you didn't even know that you're, you're picking up inside. And so I think the attitude has shifted because like you basically can get the almost free labor of open source and get your fixes too without having to contribute an enormous amount on your side from a technical point of view. So I think that attitude has really shifted um, over time. Right, right. And that's something that you bring a very good point, something that a lot of um, people who are in the open source community, but don't ever cross, like enter the um, tall skyscrapers of, of big enterprises. Um, they may not realize the degree to which this is standard practice, right? Most businesses actually have a lot of private internal forks of mm -hmm. open source mm -hmm. packages. They don't talk about it. Why would they? And the only people who know about it are people who don't sign up for full-time gig or, you know, contractors. Um, and then you see like, oh my God, you guys are maintaining a pile of patches and it's going to slow you down um, because you have to keep, you're the only one maintaining them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's something, and let me try to figure out the right way to um, frame this philosophically. Uh, like in, in the open source ecosystem, you know, a term I've used a lot around this is the word generativity, that it's one of the few things, because it's information artifacts. If you go back to like, is software IP, is software, mm -hmm, you know, like mm -hmm. you go to the Jeffersonian, you know, my candle does not diminish when I light the flame of yours or, you know, whatever, my flame isn't diminished by lighting your candle. Um, when I, you know, when, when someone else clones a copy of pandas, they don't make your copy of pandas any less valuable. It's one of the very, very rare things in um, things. I mean, we'll sort of flex the metaphysics a little bit, but a pile of source code, software projects are one of the very few things in the world that we can point to where the more you give it away, the more valuable it becomes. Right. Yes. This is like the old network effect, I think, is what you're it's describing. A it's here. a yes. network. Yes. Yes. It's kind of a, it's a, yes, because there is a network effect of it. Um, there's the very basic level, which is if you use it and someone else uses it and you have a problem, now you at least have someone else to talk to. You say, hey, did you have this problem or how did you solve this problem with this set of tools? Right. If all of us are using wildly different incompatible tools, none of us can help each other work those tools better, even if they're great tools. Right. Um, and then you add to it, then there's additional levels of network effect and network benefit when things are in coherence or in, sorry, in space coherence or are in space concordance with each other. And this harmonization as value versus um, taking um, and taking away from someone else because taking always implies taking away in the physical world, right? We have a very different view of what is value and what is damage, or what is val what is what is additive versus what is subtractive, and and so I think there's something really counterintuitive about this that most certainly managers don't have a way to account for when their people contribute to open source or when they release software into the world, um, but um, but it's also to me it just again I don't want to ding the, the 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 finance industry too much, but so much of the prevailing mentality there is zero sum is not abundance mentality or generativity, right? Um, this is absolutely true. I, I think uh, I was just thinking of two more reasons why this actually has been changing recently. So one is that using the standardized software means that 
when you hire new folks and we're always hiring new folks, you know, every single bank on, you know, on Wall Street hires new folks constantly. They yeah. are already pre-trained in the pre standard AP, API. This is like super fantastic because now you don't have to teach them. And then secondarily, whenever you have a problem, there's a global resource, Stack Overflow. Every single question you've ever asked about Pandas is there and, and right. you know, easily searchable. So again, like whenever you have a problem, that is your first resource. I mean, no matter how many experts people have, you know, in Pandas inside, there's a, a hundred times of them outside. And right. that is just such a great benefit to society, I think. Um, yeah. and, and, and in fact, yeah. that's actually one of the reasons I think Pandas is now so-called standardized. I mean, everybody's, mm -hmm. people are using it. They're copying the API. That's a whole separate discussion we can have of why <laughs> they're doing it. But, you know, I, I think it has become like almost a utility in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, good, you know, there's, there's good things about that and there's not so good things about that, but that's, I guess, yeah. just the way well, it is. As the nowadays. utility, you're, you're one of the linemen flying around, dangling off a helicopter, right? Trying to work the high voltage lines, you know, it's a utility, but for some people yep. it's a, it's still a job. It's a tough job to, to maintain and support all those different use cases. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how your role has evolved over time and how the team has evolved mm -hmm. over time. What does it look like now when every change involves a lot of thought about the impact of the change, right? The, I'm sure the velocity is not what it was when you only had, you know, a 10th or a hundredth the users. So tell me about that. Absolutely. Um, I think like from a personal point of view, uh, maybe from 2013 to maybe, I don't know, 2016 or 17, I was a very heavy contributor of actual code, like commits. Um, and, I, you know, I actually did some, some level of code review. Then I would say uh, probably in 2017, I changed almost 180, like since then, my contribution has been almost 100% code review. And my level of contribution is virtually the same, meaning, uh, you know, the number of contribu contributions or whatever you wanna call it. Um, but so, I mean, that go that's really indicative of the fact that we've had many, 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 uh, like either drive-by or repeated contributors. Our, you know, committer code base has, uh, you know, the number of, of folks who, who, you know, commit to large parts of pandas, I would say has grown from, you know, just a handful to now um, maybe 30 or 40 plus, you know, mm -hmm. we're a fairly generous package in, in terms of, you know, giving out commit rights. You know, we love for people to commit, but PAN is actually, interestingly enough, has a very interesting property. It's very wide, meaning, you know, there are so many um, areas to it, like, you know, from reading CSVs to being doing indexing to all these different IO connectors that it actually allows people to specialize. And they that's almost de facto what you have to do. You cannot mm -hmm. get your hands around everything. And so this allows folks from a lot of different walks of life, you know, some are scientists, some, you know, you're, I think you made a point earlier that most are former scientists. Yes, that's probably true. <laughs> but the right. science that they come from, you know, neuroscience, there's a chemist and there's a, there's a fellow who, you know, there's a lot of, a number of software engineers as well, but they're very, very diverse, which is fantastic. I mean, this, fantastic. this yeah. really contributes a lot to the, to the, to the, to the, to the ecosystem itself and, all, you know, the community, uh, you know, around pandas, and so, but I'll, I'll, I'll say, we've had entirely volunteer contributions. I think all the way through about 2019, 2020 timeframe, and mm -hmm. that is only the very first time when we actually had uh, funds available uh, through mm -hmm. various grants to to actually pay pay maintainers. Um, but even that did not ramp up until very recently. So, as of 2022, we actually now have three full time funded maintainers who actually contribute, you know, do code review and triage issues and so on. Um, right. And so, so Pandas is, almost, is moved into really a different phase at this point. Uh, right. it's, it's fairly mature, lots of edge cases that we're dealing with, but it's, um, the model has changed. We're almost, you know, like a little company almost at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, in, in, in this talk that you gave at Two Sigma, which is, uh, I guess, now publicly available on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm, uh, it was that's posted. Um, you You have a slide in there where you, um, indicate that just given looking at the level of commits, the amount of review necessary, the amount of work necessary, Pandas really needs to have 10 full-time developers working on it, right? To support just the care and feeding of the project. Um, That's right. This is, um, you know, Pandas is, as I say, I think we have like, you know, over 3000 open issues. And, and but what that generates is uh, between, you know, 10 and, and 30 or 40 PRs per week. This is an extremely wow. active project. And, and these all require, some are very simple, but you have to have the expertise and the, 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 the deep knowledge to really review these things. And so we've grown that over time, but it, it is, it is non-trivial. This has grown up into a very large project and it's, 
I don't actually know what would happen if we didn't have funding for for maintenance at this point. I mean, it's right. it's hard. I, I, I as I say, I think I used to review every single PR. Um, that is recently, wow. you know, my uh, I have gone down in that <laughs> reviews. You know, I still do some reviews, but uh, it has gone down, uh, you know, a lot recently. But well, I, and I think this is something that is not. Um... You know, people generally, uh, a lot of users, of course, never look at GitHub contribution statistics or things like that. But um, I, I do want to just draw awareness for the listeners on the podcast of the degree. I mean, Jeff, you're a pretty modest guy. Uh, you're a very talented guy, but you're also a pretty modest guy. The degree of Jeff's contribution is significant. Let's let's call it that. I mean, you have just been nonstop pounding away on stuff for a very long time. And it is um, truly, I, I don't think you're celebrated enough for your accomplishments in this regard. The world really does owe you a tremendous, at least many, many rounds of beer and a lot of good wine for <laughs> how much, you know, at a minimum for, for how much work you've done there and growing the team, you know, it's non-trivial. A lot of open source projects do flame out because they can't manage to yep. cohere a team. And then the original author or maintainers sort of, you know, move on, do other things. And then the project sort mm -hmm. of withers. But the Pandas project is a really nice example of what happens when you do grow that team intentionally. Um, and so tell me a little bit about how you think about, you know, you did say, there's a lot of places where people get specialized. That's one aspect of how the team grows. But when you're growing the team and as you're mentoring people, um, you say you're liberal with the commit bit, which is great. But then, of course, not everyone uh, is uh, necessarily ready to take the next step and become an active maintainer. What do you look for? And and what would you what wisdom could you give people maybe who are interested in contributing either to Pandas or to any other project? Are there things you've seen that are really good, you know, could get tips that you could give or mindset or whatever kinds of things you could advice that you give to people. No, thank you for those, uh, those kind words. Yes. You know, I've been a, a long time contributor to pandas and, and yes, I've done a lot over time. It, <laughs> it's it been a fun. lot it, of hard it was, work. It, it, yeah, it, it definitely has definitely has. I mean, as I said, I think, you know, pandas right now, you know, it's definitely moved from the let's build this cool project and, and, you know, Break things fast and 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 make it really super useful. To now, it is really a mature product. It is very. Um, we have to view it in a very different light. Like, whenever I'm like, okay, I want to deprecate this thing. Like, we have to think about, you know, this is going to, you know, cause millions of people to change code. That doesn't mean we don't do things, of course, but we're just a little bit more thoughtful and and retrospective about things. Um, and I, I I definitely think that you know, growing or getting you know support. Uh, really ongoing support. Obviously the monetary aspect helps. You know, there are folks who, um, you know, they do may have day jobs, but they are able to contribute hours, uh, you know, to, to really to really work on Pandas. But I mean, I think the heart and soul of Pandas is really attracting newcomers really. Um, and, and of course we absolutely love um, diversity among newcomers. Uh, it's interesting. We had uh, one of the uh, maintainers, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, we ran mm -hmm. like this worldwide sprint. I think it was 24 hours for just documentation. And I think we had, um, gosh, we had like 50 or 60 contributors, you know, literally worldwide from like 30 countries. It was like amazing. And I think wow. things like that, like really help, uh, you know, encourage uh, folks to do this. You know, we want more and more. And so, because what happens is, you know, you have, you know, 50 contributors, whatever, and then maybe one of those becomes a maintainer. I mean, this is really the, There's I think- Definitely the, a funnel. The, yeah. yeah, exactly. This is really the hard part. And it's because, you know, it's a combination of you have to have your own internal drive, just like any other you know job that you do. You have to have drive in that job. It has to be interesting to you. And I think that's actually right. where pandas can really shine. We we have so mm -hmm. many areas that you can find some little. It could be a little niche or a big niche. I we you know, have one contributor. Um, all he works on is the styler. You know, this is the the, the way we uh, output formatting. But he's done such an amazing job on that and like loves doing it. I'm like. Great, <laughs> you have more power to you, and it's actually in some sense it's almost now a mini project. You know, he will come back and 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 review all the PRs that are associated with that. So I think you know if I had to say what people should do, it's like you know find um, a project. It could be a big one, it could be a small one. I think big ones are actually easier to approach simply because huh. you know they they have like lots of guidelines already of how to do things. It makes the getting started part really really easy. I mean, this right. is one of the things over time we spent enormous amount of time and effort really making the documentation, uh, you know, how to contribute actually very accessible. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's one, you know, like if you can just like, you know, in th you know, run your three commands and just like, boom, you can build the project and you have instructions on how to do it. It's a really, really great thing um, to contribute. 
And then eventually, like, if you have the drive, maybe your employer sponsors you, you know, maybe you're just doing it your part time, you can become a maintainer of a project. It's, it's, it's not like tremendously hard, but it's, but it's also like, I'll just, I'll divide the maintainers sort of into two camps here. One is people who, you know, are really super awesome doing, you know, code. They can, they're mm -hmm. awesomely detailing code, but then they're, they're, and that we absolutely love and appreciate. We also appreciate folks who can code review other people. And you know, right. give like nudging comments to contributors because not everyone is an expert in open source. Not everyone, uh, right. you know, knows knows how to build their environment. And so, helping folks out and, e and even contributing to things like documentation, uh, community, these are all super important things. Um, if I have my nugget of advice, you know, find a find a project, start contributing, um, get find a community you like, and 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 can, you just help out. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's. Um... That is an interesting thing about approaching the larger projects, right? That have they they are more likely to have some things in place to to help you get started, um, and they also appreciate um, the importance of introducing and being welcoming to new maintainers and and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's definitely not uh, smaller projects. You you can if you're passionate about it, right? You have the passion. It's kind of hit or miss. You might find a maintainer that's very welcoming. You might also find one that for whatever reasons, it could be something as simple as like language difficulties, right? Maybe you yes, guys speak different language or something. Uh, all sorts of reasons why then the collaboration doesn't really work. Um, but if it does work, it'd be really great because then you're you know closer to the the the, the core development of the project. But, uh, but I, view certainly, it as the, I was gonna say, I view it as the small town versus the big town, right? Like that's you, right. Can, you can go to a small town and it could be fit you like a glove. And, and that is like super awesome, great. Or maybe not so great if it doesn't if it doesn't fit you because you you know everybody in that town. Whereas a big city, you can be somewhat anonymous, but you can find your niche. And so it, right, there's, right. there's different schools of thought here, I think, on on what projects, but I, I, I guess just the advice is just try. <laughs> just try it, yeah. Yeah. Well, so so then you know, you did say something about how uh, just earlier there's a comment you made that Pandas has really kind of grown up now. It's a very stable product. It's of course got very, very wide. It's it's a standard. It's quite ubiquitously adopted. There are people cloning the API, right, for other kinds of things. Um, but but what Pandas fundamentally still is, it hasn't strayed from its original thing, which is it's a library that developers use, or sorry, that data scientists or you know, quants or whatever use generally locally single machine to process mm -hmm. some data, to play with their data, oftentimes exploratory scenarios. Um, so now in recent years, there's really been this emergence or, or let's say resurgence of focus on data engineering. And I mean, you know, what used to be um, a lot of data, data warehouse kind of type stuff is now shifted into, uh, you know, with, with the advent of cloud data warehouses and whatnot, there's been a shift in the data engineering discipline and the emergence of the modern data stack, right, is now the term of art that people use. And there's many popular tools and scripts to schedule this kind of pipeline or do that kind of distributed comp compute and all these things. So I guess my question, and it's kind of open-ended, but what do you see as the role of Pandas, which is very, you know, um, uh, I would say still quite focused on the single user, single node kind of experience. What is the role of Pandas in that kind of a world? Um, what do you think? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, this, uh, you know, this is, is, of course, the endless debate of, you know, hey, you know, my tool doesn't fit my use case. So let's just, instead of trying to, you know, uh, like improve upon the existing tool, let's just go write a new one. And that's what a lot of folks have done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like fundamentally, like when I'm working with data or, uh, you know, really looking at something, I really, I want to do the simplest thing possible. And so the simplest thing, of course, is to just do single node, just you know, immediate, uh, you know, eager execution. Just show me the data. Uh, you know, let me look at it. Let me transform it. Let me play with it. And right. if your data size is up to like, so so you know, maybe five years ago, maybe having a five or ten gigabyte um, data frame was actually quite exceptional. I think nowadays right. maybe that is much more common. But even mm -hmm. still, everything that size and less is super common. It's you know, having yeah. data bigger than that surely happens. So maybe instead of happening in, uh, you know, 5% of the cases, you know, five years ago, now it's maybe 15% of cases, but still mm -hmm. we have that 85% of cases where pandas just works. It works well. It's actually quite performant and it, mm -hmm. it has a lot of bells and whistles. Everybody can, you know, you can write your syntax and, and, and really get out what you need, what, what you need. 
it's funny. Everybody's like, oh, my script is too slow. I'm like, okay. Or, or, or maybe it doesn't fit in the memory. I'm like, okay, buy a faster computer or get more memory. And actually that is a really, really good case today. I mean, I can spin up a node, my, my single machine for two terabytes for like a dollar an hour or something. Right. Why do I need to even do distributed compute I, right. in a lot in large cases? So I think like pan is really, it's not just hobbyists. It's like, it's, it's basically replacing Excel. That's the competitor today for pandas to, to be honest, to a large extent. Um, yes, obviously we are seeing convergence among the so-called big data and the data science stack. It's been happening for years. We're getting closer and closer. I mean, what's been happening is, you know, things, people like the Spark folks and, you know, the, the, the BigQuery folks, now they all, and even the database folks, they all allow you to run Python code as, mm -hmm. you know, user-defined functions. And you can do, you can use Python or Pandas inside, you know, using a, a you know, a chunk of data. And, and of course, you know, the Python ecosystem grew Dask to do exactly this, uh, you know, type of thing. It uses, you know, Pandas internally. And so I, there's absolutely a role for both here. I, I think, you know, when you truly need to uh, process a massive amount of data, and that could be maybe massive means I'll, it's 100 megabytes of data, but maybe it takes, you know, an hour to chew on. I do want to do things in a parallel way. And right. I do think, you know, pandas can uh, become even more performant, you know, uh, dispatching some computation in a more distributed way, maybe just on its local machine. I think that's going to happen. I think that's the direction we're moving, you know, using some various engines, like we use Numba, um, we mm -hmm. use, we're going to be using Pyre a little bit to do some of sort of this, uh, we'll call it local distributed compute. I mean, like right. one of my favorite things to do is spin up a DAS cluster, but on a single machine. It feels mm -hmm. like I have amazing superpower. I can, I can do anything I need to do. And I don't have to worry about networks and spinning up extra, you know, machines. So I think that's like a really big use case. Like that is almost my ideal. Have a single big machine, um, use Pandas, it just works. Uh, you right. know, maybe with maybe with Dask or something, but so I think pandas can definitely serve um, a really compelling uh, you know use case here for just use it. If it doesn't work, get a bigger machine. If it still doesn't work, uh, go distributed. Now, right. of course, the problem here, and I do I do touch on this a little bit in uh, this YouTube video, is that you effectively have to switch your API at that point, and that right. is a shame. I mean, it would be great if we could all use one single API and just call it a day. Pandas has become that API, um, but it is eager execution. So whenever you go distributed, you really have to, it, 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 it leaks it basically, it leaks the distributed nature. And so yes. you, you really have to switch. It's unfortunate. And so actually in, inside Two Sigma, what we do is we use Pandas in a capacity at the single node level. And if we have to go distributed, we do. And we, use still, we can still use the power of Pandas like to really, uh, you know, do the, the hands-on manipulation. So I think right. the world is converging. I think the world, uh, you know, can still use pandas in a lot of scenarios. And so I think it will continue right. to, to exist for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, then that's, that's a great answer. And I, I think from, from my perspective, um, it's, uh, it's not just a, there is the raw capability aspect of like, yeah, machine data sets are bigger now, but machines are also bigger. And also people are more familiar. I would say data scientists, not just software developers, but people who are uh, you know, less sophisticated from a software development perspective, they're more familiar with cloud. And so they can spin up some cloud resources to do things. Um, but then um, but then the other thing I think about is that uh, data science is crossing into mainstream production use cases inside a lot of businesses. And so when that happens, the management of your compute infrastructure falls then under a different team than the data science team, than the exploration research teams. And that other team is maybe not so sanguine on this idea of dynamically spinning up a bunch of random stuff that they don't really know, like, how good is your failover versus we want to watch all the nodes. You know, how are you doing some Kubernetes provisioning on your thing versus how we want to do it and all this kind of stuff. And we have standard machine sizes that you're supposed to get. I know in your research cluster, you have all these things you could do, but not in the production cluster. And so one thing, one dynamic I'm seeing is that sort of a lot of data scientists, I feel like if they, they realize, look, if this stuff going into production is going to have to end up in this kind of infrastructure mode anyway, then I'll just start using those tools and do my exploration in those tools, right? Mm -hmm. And I will use, I will, you know, even though my data set may not start 
uh, requiring a Spark, Databricks, whatever kind of environment, I'll just start doing exploration there because I'm going to have to end up there anyway, right? Um, likewise, you know, with Snowflake and Snowpark and, and whatever it might be. So there is that kind of school of thought, I think, or that kind of pragmatism that is changing people's approaches to how they even do the exploratory mode. But the other thing I would say, you know, kind of almost as a counter to that is there is fundamentally this idea, however, that you know, whether the production deployment environment is different or not, empowering, and obviously Python has always been about this, the Python data ecosystem at least, empowering the um, the domain expert, the subject matter expert mm -hmm. to go as far as they possibly can, to reduce the friction as much as possible, to reduce their cognitive burden as much as possible, mm -hmm. so that they can self-service their computational needs to answer their problem and to basically cycle as fast as their brain can run. That's always, I think, for me, been the dream of this stuff. And that, for me, is the reason why tools like Pandas, tools like Numbo, or even a single node DAS cluster are so important, because it lets that single person, that single brain with all the insight and all the questions maximally take advantage of a low friction compute environment. Um, Absolutely. You've hit on really two key points here. One is, you know, the second point, I don't think I have anything to add, you know, uh, less friction is extremely important in development. But I think your first point of, making a frictionless environment from development all the way through production, that is the hardest thing, you know, not just yes. not, not, just, not just the average corporation, but I think most places, this is hard. And you, you hit upon the answer really is to use the same tooling in both places. And if that tooling is using pandas and analyzing this data set, well, let's put that exact environment in production and just make it work. So then I don't have to change anything. I don't have to worry about, there's differences between here or here. And that tooling, by the way, is actually really, you know, e easy to use. And I already know how to use it, more power to it. And so I think mm -hmm. these are some of the convergences that we see. Um, and this is why I think some of the vendors, you know, Databricks, or you mentioned Snowpark, they actually embed the ability to run uh, these processes inside their mm -hmm. systems. I think it's super powerful. Combining these and, things. And, and, not, Snowpark, not and Snowpark exclude. embeds Anaconda actually quite specifically. So that's- Absolutely, yeah. yes. You have the entire data science stack and then, oh, by the way, if you need to go distribute it, well, it's it's straightforward to do. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Well, there's there's a lot more I'd love to talk to you about, but we're we're sort of running out of time. Um, and uh, and uh, maybe we'll have a follow up. And I'd love to talk to you about work life balance and other kinds of things, and and some of the other kinds of fun things between pandas and databases and IBIS, SQL, you know, whatever kinds of things. Um, so so hopefully in the future we have another conversation about some of those fun things. But Jeff, this has been absolute pleasure, delight to, to to chat with you, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day, uh, hacking and coding and, and managing and all these things um, to to chat with us. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. No, thank you so much, Peter. This has been a great pleasure, and you know, best to 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 you and your family. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and we hope you found this episode valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five star review. You can find more information and resources at anaconda.com.